The other matter on my agenda today is that I was implored to read a particular book. <laughs> People just said, well, you've got to read this book. You've got to read this objectivist tome that, 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 that will answer all your questions. And the title of it is, quote, The Logical Leap, Induction in Physics, end quote, by an objectivist called David Harriman, and with a foreword by Leonard Peikoff, in one, one of the great luminaries of objectivism. So I got the book, and I read sections, and I'm sorry to say, nothing new uh, it did not persuade me. I went straight to the parts I was really interested in, you know, how, how did universal gravitation come about, and uh, how, do we, how do we marry up uh, the existence of Newton's theory with Einstein's theory? What does he say about that? Because whatever is said about that tells me the whole story about what this fellow thinks about how knowledge is constructed. So we're going to go through that section. Now, before that, well, let's go to what he said about Popper. Okay, word search on Popper. Of course, he comes up. Well, it's a complete hatchet job, <laughs> of course, as you would expect. He doesn't get quoted. Uh, his name appears twice in the text. Here it is. I'll, I'll read the, the passage in full. This is the complete treatment by Mr. David Harriman and his book all about the use of induction in physics. This is what he says about Popper, the sum total. Quote, During the past century, however, many philosophers have rejected the validity of induction and argued that every generalization is an error. For example, Karl Popper claimed that all the laws of Kepler, Galileo and Newton have been falsified by demanding that a true generalization must apply with unlimited precision to an unlimited domain. Popper upheld a mystical view of truth that is forever outside the reach of man and accessible only to an omniscient God. In the end, he was left with two types of generalizations, those that have been proven false and those that will be proven false. He was then accused by later philosophers of being too optimistic. They insisted that nothing can be proven, not even a generalization's falsehood. End quote. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That, the entire book, which is 300 and something pages, that's what you get about Popper. Not one quote from his work, nothing. Just assertions about what he thought. That's the standard of scholarship we've got here. Popper did not claim all the laws of Newton have been falsified, as claimed there, and he did not say everything will be proven false. That's not the epistemology. The fact that knowledge contains error, yes, sure, does not mean we will find it and therefore prove it false. And anyway, this word proven, proven, proven is the wrong word. And then the author wants to link Popper to relativists or skeptics. It's just completely ignorant. It's not fair in the same way that, that the fa as I keep saying the favour is not returned. The objectivists are not connecting with quotes. Pull out some quotes. Pull out some quotes and take ex exception to them. Fine. Let's explain Popper in his own words. Summary probably of a summary. In fact, well, he does link to a reference to objective knowledge, but it's just a book. There's no page number. But let's go on to the meat of the matter, so to speak. The book, this book then goes on to explain how Newton discovered universal gravitation. The book provides a history of what Newton used universal gravitation to do in predicting tides and shapes of orbits. And he just asserts that the move from Kepler's laws to an inverse square law is induction. And further, in a chapter called Discovery is Proof, the claim is that the mathematical proof of the inverse square law of gravitation amounts to its discovery. At no point do we concern ourselves with the fact that it is strictly false refuted by experiment. The author writes on this, quote, A rigorous process of inductive logic enabled Newton to climb from narrower generalizations to his fundamental laws, end quote. We're never told what this inductive logic is exactly. The description offered is perfectly consistent with Newton conjecturing the explanation. He goes on to say, quote, the author says, quote, For example, he did not leap to the law of universal gravitation and then search for confirming instances. Rather, as we saw... He began by identifying the nature of the solar force on the planets. In the Principia, he then showed that a similar force is exerted by Jupiter and Saturn on their respective moons, and he therefore had a law pertaining to both planets and moons. He next showed that a similar force is exerted by Earth on both terrestrial bodies and our moon, and he therefore had a law that applied to all bodies on Earth's surface, as well as planets and moons. He then showed that the attractive force is not merely exerted by Earth as a whole, but it is exerted independently by every bit of matter making up the Earth. His analysis of Earth's shape and precession and the ocean tides provided important evidence for this conclusion, end quote. Okay, so he showed, proved or induced a complete falsehood because there is no such force. And he came up with the law 
not, <laughs> not by looking at the instances where it worked in these different places and then generalizing to the law. No, he had the general law and then realized that necessarily it applied everywhere throughout the entire universe. So, of course, to each of those places, each of those instances where it applied. Anyway, the author goes on to say, quote, If at the end Newton had been asked, now that you have this theory, how are you going to prove it? He could answer simply by pointing to the discovery process itself. The step-by-step -step logical sequence by which he arrived at his theory is the proof. Each step was the grasp of a causal connection by the mathematical processing of observational data. Since there were no arbitrary leaps, there is no problem of justifying them, end quote. So, according to the author, therefore, Newton's theory of gravity is proved and justified, and yet it's false, which is interesting. I wonder how the author goes about squaring this circle. They've got to mention Einstein eventually, right? And they do. So let's read what is said. <laughs> Here we go. Strap yourself in. Quote, <laughs> The major axis of Mercury's orbit is observed to rotate very slowly. As seen from Earth, the total rotation appears to be about 1.56 degrees per century. Calculations show that almost 90% of this apparent rotation is caused by the precession of the Earth's spin axis, which is entirely explained by Newton's theory. Of the remaining effect, more than 90% is caused by the gravitational pull of the other planets, which is also explained by Newton's theory. That leaves less than 1% of the total observed effect, which amounts to 43 arc seconds per century, unexplained by Newton's theory. <laughs> this residual effect is explained by Einstein's theory, the predictions of which differ slightly from Newton's in the strong gravitational field near the sun, end quote. So he's completely confused prediction with explanation. He's saying that well, most of Mercury's orbit is explained by Newton's theory. The residual left over is explained by Einstein's theory. But the explanation <laughs> in Newton's theory is a force, the existence of a force. So he's saying, well, almost all of it is explained by this force of gravity. It's just the residual that we use the curvature of space-time for, which isn't a force. <laughs> what is he talking about? How can you both... Explain, explain the same thing by recourse to force and not a force simultaneously. It's a strict contradiction. <laughs> Doesn't work at all. Prediction, okay, even then we're, it's a bit dodgy. We can predict the entirety of, Newton, of, of, of Mercury's orbit, the entirety of it, by recourse to general relativity. We never have to bring in Newton's law at all. We don't, in fact. No, no, no astrophysicist worth their salt is going to try and predict where Mercury is going to be. In fact any other planet. So precisely speaking, you're not going to use Newton's theory, not in this day and age. If you want highly precise predictions of where those things are going to be, you're going to use general relativity. You're going to use a computer, but you know, program with general relativity to get the position exactly right. So no, no. Mercury's orbit is entirely explained by Einstein's theory, entirely. Otherwise, it would be like saying, well, you know, much of the life on Earth can be explained by creationism or spontaneous generation. Uh, some of the rest by Lamarckism, and then a little bit left over is evolution by natural selection. <laughs> I mean, how do we explain how GPS works? Most of it being explained by Newton's theory and the rest being explained by general relativity? I mean, Google Maps will tell you you're right outside the post office when in fact you're standing in the middle of a field if we use Newtonian gravity for it, but hey. Or how about gravitational waves? It is not that Newton's gravity is true in some domain or not. It's true or not. Surely the objectivists can agree with that. I know they talk about contextual knowledge, but contextual truth, that's relativist if anything is. The fact is, Newton's theory is not true. It works in some places because it's an approximation containing some truth, but strictly false. It's an approximation to reality, not reality. Approximations to reality are not reality. They are not the truth. And even where it works, Newton's theory, it never works exactly. Newton's theory, the predictions looked at at high enough resolution, do not correspond exactly to where any of the planets are. Mercury is just a spectacular case in point. So there we have it. Most of Mercury's orbit is explained by Newton, and just the remainder, just the correction, is explained by Einstein. So what this means, taken literally, is most of Mercury's orbit is explained by an inverse square law for force. It's explained by a force. And the remainder 
is explained not by an inverse square law, but by a metric and tensors and the curvature of space-time. So how does reality know what to invoke and when? How does it know that, well, for now, gravity is a force and now for the remainder, it's the curvature of space-time? No, it's all wrong. It's all the curvature of space-time. That's what gravity is. That's how we explain, not merely predict, explain what's going on. Not merely with the precession of Mercury's orbit, which is the example being used here, but all orbits, all falling objects, all tides, every single gravitational effect is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. It has nothing to do with a force. It has nothing to do with an inverse square law. That has been refuted. The inverse square law is a nice heuristic. It's an approximation to reality in some way, shape or form, but known to be false. And yes, in Popper's conception, sure, Einstein's general relativity is an approximation to reality as well. We don't know how it's false. We expect it to turn out false. We can't say it will turn out false, as incorrectly implied in this text, because we don't know for sure anything, including that we're going to find the successor. We hope to. We're trying hard to. We expect there must be, because you know the theory of gravity, general relativity, just doesn't comport properly with quantum theory. All that's missed. All this context, all the richness of the history of science, and the philosophy of science, science itself, and actual physics, it's all missed here. This is a fictitious story about how science works. So not, it makes no contact with what's really going on. Science is not merely about predictions. The orbit of Mercury is not explained by, explained, not just predicted, explained by Newton. It's explained best, explained only, so far as we know, by Einstein's general relativity, by the curvature of space-time. And whatever the successor is, whatever the successor is, we don't expect it to go back to being forces. Anyway, the author goes on. Einstein did not refute the laws of Newton, just as Newton did not refute the laws of Kepler. In both cases, the truth of the earlier theory was presupposed, and then a more general theory was developed that applied within an expanded context of knowledge. And in both cases, the expanded context of knowledge included small discrepancies between new data and the old theory, which were then explained by the new theory. This is often how science progresses. End quote. That is completely false. Einstein did not assume Newton true and take him further, as was just claimed there. The, the, the truth of the earlier theory was not presupposed. The truth of the earlier theory was, I say again, that there was a force. There was this force. This pull, this attraction, and in fact, it moved instantaneously through space, which is a problem. That was only solved, shown to be unnecessary, false, by the existence of a new explanation. Doing away with the need for forces and instantaneous action at a distance. Einstein did not assume Newton true. He, from the ground up, changed the foundations of what gravity, time and space were. The poverty of the analysis in this book is absolutely striking. It's a very desperate attempt by someone who knows something about the history of physics to salvage induction. They are dogmatically wedded to objectivist epistemology. They need, for whatever reason, to salvage it from, well, I guess to some extent the influence of Popper or wider understandings of the history of science. They need to try and salvage it, but they can only do so by literally butchering the history and the science. It's true desperation. But the author goes on, quote, there is only one aspect of Newton's theory that was rejected rather than absorbed into Einstein's theory. And in this case, one can only wish that Einstein had been consistent in his rejection. Newton treated the concepts space and time as existence, independent of bodies rather than as relationships among bodies. Thus, he viewed space as an infinite cosmic backdrop that exists independent of the bodies placed in it. And he claimed that this backdrop has real physical effects on the bodies that accelerate with respect to it. Newton offered scientific arguments to support his view of space and time, but these arguments are non sequiturs. Absolute space and time played no role in the reasoning that proved his theory. Thus, I had no need to mention these ideas while presenting his discovery process. In fact, absolute space and time were intimately connected to Newton's religious views, and therefore they are an arbitrary element in his theory. End quote. <laughs> so, here we're just saying, well, Newton was religious, and so this is why he had this vision of space and time. But again, that is not, he begins there by saying, there is only one aspect of Newton's theory that was rejected rather than absorbed in Einstein's theory. And he's talking about space and time. No, he's not. No, no, no. <laughs> force. What about the gravitational force? The force of gravitation. 
That, that does not feature in Einstein's theory. It is clear. There is no force. There is no action at a distance. There are many aspects of Newton's theory that don't appear in Einstein's. It is <laughs> laughable. There's no mention of Eddington's experiment. Okay, the idea that starlight bends more during a solar eclipse than it does under Newton's theory, falsifying, refuting Newton's theory. That's an egregious omission. And one might presume deliberate. We can only understand why Newton's theory is strictly wrong by recourse to experiments like that or any of the other countless observations as of this date, such as Mercury's orbit, where it makes the wrong prediction. It is wrong, period, full stop. It's not just about the wrong prediction. It invokes, invokes, mind you, things in reality that don't exist, period, full stop. It's wrong. There's no mention of how the force of gravity under Newton's theory moved instantaneously between bodies. And that was replaced by a, an influence from gravity, the curvature of space-time, that was limited by the speed of light. There's no concern here about the relativity of space and time, rather than being a fixed space and time of Newton. This is an absolute crucial difference. He tries to get there, but he says it's to do with religion or something. Okay, so enough of that. There's just not enough time to do that kind of thing, as you can see. Read all the books with all the egregious errors in history and science and misinterpretations of Popper and can't read more on induction. This is, it's, 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 there's just such a poverty of epistemology there. It's root and branch false. So this is me doing my best.